Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining me for today's webinar, which is Achieve More with Less Stress, a brain-based approach. For those of you who don't know me, I am Michelle MacArthur Morgan, founding partner of Jigsaw at Work Learning Consultancy and creator of the Jigsaw Discovery Tool and Behavioural Framework. My fascination in life is human behaviour. For 25 years now, I've studied the psychology of behaviour and over the last 10 years have been drawn in to learn more about neuroscience and look at human behaviour from the perspective of neuroscience. It's these two disciplines that I actually use within my work with individuals and teams. I help them to understand themselves and others, to enable them to develop the skills needed for the future of work in the, in the next norm, whatever that turns out to be. Ultimately, to build stronger, more agile and profitable businesses. In order to have sustained performance, we need to be at the top of our game. We need to have the ability to see trends emerging, to generate insights, those aha moments, and then be agile and adaptable enough to respond quickly. To do this, we need a workforce that knows how to leverage the power of the mind, that has the developed high level cognitive skills. A workforce that is resilient, not feeling stressed or anxious or on the pathway to burnout. And a workplace that is psychologically safe. In our webinar today, we aim to address some of these issues. So today we're going to look at how we can support people to think and behave differently and we're going to look at some brain-based solutions and tools to help develop psychological safety. Imagine if all our workplaces were filled with trust and people were allowed to be their authentic self and feel free to speak openly. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what I call the brain basics and answer that question, why are our brains exploding at the moment? Why are 58% of man managers worried about staff being on sick due to mental health impact of, of working or due to mental health um, with the impacts of working in the lockdown situation? Why are over 50% of people concerned about being able to manage their own stress levels at the moment? Well, the brain has a very simple organizing principle to maximize pleasure and minimize danger. All information coming into the brain is received as either being a threat or a reward. Pain or pleasure. We move towards the pleasure and away from the pain or the threat. Threats are processed faster, they are stronger, and the effects last longer in the brain than does the reward. So we need many more rewards than the threats that we are currently receiving. Bad is stronger than good. The status of the limbic system, our emotional brain, is five times that of the prefrontal cortex, which is our cognitive, rational or executive thinking brain. When the limbic system is in charge, it makes it very difficult for us to, to collaborate, to be creative, to make decisions. We develop a tunnel vision and our ability to have those insightful moments is diminished. If we just look at the levels of threat, there are actually three levels of threat. Level one is when the threat is in the broader environment. We become more alert than usual. For us in the UK, when we first heard of the coronavirus in China, we were concerned, but not alarmed. The threat was still a long way from us. A level two threat is in your neighborhood. At this point, the alarming brain system kicks in, which starts to impede our thinking and creativity. In terms of the COVID-19, it's now landed on our shores and is spreading throughout the country. A level three threat is in your street. For example, you may have been furloughed. You may know someone who is ill. You may have been ill yourself. At this point, the survival instinct kicks in. Mental processing slows down as the 
prefrontal cortex, the PFC, starts to close down. We move into a panic situation and our mental and general health starts to be challenged. It can be a little bit like talking to someone who's had a bottle of whiskey on an empty stomach. Logic is not helpful. At the beginning of lockdown, we saw the effects of the level three threats with the mass hysteria and panic buying. As the weeks have gone by, we've seen the level threats fluctuating, but generally moving down more towards the level two as we start to feel more secure, staying at home and with social distancing. As we now start to think about coming out of the lockdown, you may have noticed a stepping up again of the threat level. People are refusing to let their children go back to school. People fearing that their workplace will not be safe when they return. The leisure trade and transport trade are talking of it being years before business levels are back to what they were pre-COVID-19. Thinking about the challenges ahead, how can we support ourselves and our colleagues and team members to be at the top of the game, to give us all that best possible chance of economic recovery and security? It may or it may not surprise some of you that the biggest threats are social threats. Social acceptance is hardwired into our subconsciousness. Rejection is a real cause of social pain and distress. The dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, DACC, is part of the brain where physical pain shows up. And scientists have now discovered that social pain which can be caused by something as simple as not being cc'd into an email, also shows up in the DACC. And even more amazing, there is some evidence that taking a normal painkiller can actually dull down the social pain. So just as stubbing your toe, hitting your thumb with the hammer, creates activity within the DACC, so does that social pain. For those who attended my previous webinar earlier in the week, you may recall that I touched on the model, the SCARF model, the five domains of social experience as defined by Dr. David Rock. Today, I want to speak a little bit more about it because it is such an important model. If I was asked to give one piece of wisdom to an aspiring leader, I would say, always think SCARF when leading and working with people. If you want to enable people to be at their best, to feel psychologically safe, then understanding the SCARF model and leveraging the power of threat and reward is a must. So if we just look at each one of those five social domains. Status, that feeling of being valued, being asked for an opinion, perception of how we rank ourselves against our best self. Our perception of how other people perceive us and rank us against other people. Certainty, our ability to predict what is going on. Uncertainty is classed as a very strong threat. If we cannot classify something as good or bad, then it will automatically be perceived as very bad. Autonomy, perception of how much control we have. Relatedness, that sense of belonging, being part of the in-group, knowing where you fit into your team and the organisation. Fairness, perception of fair exchange. If the scarf domains are not managed, then it can lead to overwhelm, reactive thinking, Minimal creativity and collaboration. Tunnel vision sets in, shutting down our options. However, if we manage our SCARF domains, it can enable engagement, motivation, high levels of focus and periods of peak performance. So we can start to see the importance of the time that we're facing, unprecedented times, the importance of actually leveraging the power of the SCARF model, and actually trying to make sure that we create SCARF rewards. 
minimizing the effect of the scarf threats that are all around us at the moment. If we just start to think about some of those scarf threats that's around at the moment, we can see here life threatening health risks, the health risk of loved ones, health risks of friends and colleagues, the risk of easing social distancing, risk of going back to work, your finances, finances of loved ones, that wider economic picture. Generally, what is life and work going to be like? When will it all end? Will it all end? One of the biggest challenges right now, though, is that there are very few people alive who have had to live with anything similar before. Good leadership is critical. To get our people and our organisations through the pandemic and to establish the next normal. Leaders have messages they have to cascade down to anyone who manages people. Leaders should help people mentally prepare for the unknown. They should steer people towards more adaptive actions. You may say, well, what do I mean by adaptive actions? Well, there are three types of actions. First of all, we have the under-reacting actions. I'm sure we've all know, see people who minimal empathy for the situation. They're underplaying, playing down the situation all the time, burying their heads in the sands, saying and doing nothing. We then have adaptive behaviour. When we are looking at adaptive behaviour, it's all about accepting the reality of the situation, helping ourselves and other people prepare for the worst, empathising with the situation we are in. The last type of action is overreacting. And that's where people are obsessing with what is going on. Constantly, BBC News 24-7. Creating panic all around, focusing in very much and obsessing about the issues, the problems, the threats, creating that panic. At the moment, what we tend to be seeing is evidence of people swinging between underreacting and overreacting. And what we need to do, certainly within our organisations, is bring everybody towards being more adaptive, accepting the reality of the situation, whatever that situation is that your organisation is in, and then coming together collectively, creatively, to find a way forward. So if we return to the SCARF model, and just look at what adaptive behaviour may well look like for the SCARF model. Status, there's probably not a lot that we can actually do in the current situation around status. Certainty, find ways of increasing certainty, often and well. Communication is a great way of increasing certainty, especially if we communicate often and well. Communication to create certainty should be incremental. So, for example, we're going to have a Zoom meeting every Friday. We're going to have a Zoom meeting every Friday at two o'clock. We're going to have a Zoom meeting every Friday at two o'clock for an hour. <coughs> we're going to have a Zoom meeting every Friday at two o'clock for an hour. And everyone will be asked to share a win they've had this week. Each time we say it, we add more certainty, small incremental certainty rewards. Setting expectations. Be implicit rather than explicit. Tell your workforce exactly how much cash you have right now, how long it will last. Tell them the exact position that the organisation is in. Give them a definite date. 
that will be the earliest that they will be asked to go back to work. I have a friend and I was speaking to him the other day and he was telling me how he's been contacted by his employers to say he will not be returning to work before the 21st of July. That for him has created certainty because now he's been out and he's planning and he's doing his decking in his garden and he's got a list of things. He's got a plan in his mind. He's created certainty for the things that he can do between now and the 21st of July. Every time you have a little bit of certainty, share it. No matter how small the news is, little and often is the key to creating certainty rewards. Autonomy. Unexpected rewards in any of the, across any of the social domains are the strongest rewards. So think how you can create unexpected autonomy. For example, people at the moment don't feel that they have much autonomy. They've been told they've got to stay at home. They've been told they can only do certain things. So show them how they can actually take back some of that control. Things such as deciding their own working hours. As you start to return to work, perhaps choosing which day they go into the office. Deciding how often and when they want to meet online. Help people identify what control they do have. Now, one area that we all have control over is stress, our own stress levels. So show people how they have that control, deciding how much sleep and exercise they have, deciding to eat healthily, deciding not to tune into the news 24 seven, deciding to make sure they put time aside for relaxation or meditation. Deciding to identify the stress triggers what types of situations actually make them feel stressed? And then they can choose to self-regulate. Or as James Gross referred to it as situation selection. Choosing not to put yourself in a situation which you know you find stressful. Encourage team members to think about sustainable practices and ways in which they can help themselves and each other to look after their mental well-being. Having that psychological safe workspace where team members can be authentic and have the confidence to speak openly about how they're feeling and how people could help and support them is an important part of maintaining mental health and well-being. Allow flexibility in challenging times. We need principles to guide people rather than controls to control people. Think about your own organisation. Have you got principles to help guide or have you got rules to control people? Relatedness. This is an area where you can get some of the strongest rewards. Encourage team members to think creatively. Perhaps arrange virtual lunch dates. Have non-work ha non happy hours virtually. Have virtual tours of each other's houses. Meet the kids or meet the pets. Encourage regular non-work related calls and chats. One thing to think about here is just to think about the workplace rituals which used to take place and then ask, how can we replicate those virtually? A particular favourite of mine I was told about the other week is think back to when we were all in offices and we'd go along to whatever meetings and we came out of those meetings and very often one of the first things we did was after we returned to the desk and put our bits and pieces down on the desk we'd perhaps go and get a coffee and we'd stop off on the way or perhaps meet in the kitchen with one of our colleagues who had been in that meeting and we used to like to catch up and share our thoughts and experiences of the meeting. Now for some people some people actually missing that opportunity because obviously you can't do that in the same way with an online meeting. But what we can do is come out of our online meetings, pick up the phone and call that person that we'd normally 
catch up with at the end of those in-person meetings. Yesterday, I was in a meeting myself and I had literally only just ended the meeting when my phone rang. And it was a colleague who had been in the meeting asking me my thoughts. And whilst I was on the phone to him, I heard the phone bleeping and it was another colleague from the meeting who was trying to get through to me for exactly the same reasons. The last domain, fairness, is something which I could have a major, I think we could have a major impact as we start to move into the next stages of easing of the restrictions. Leaders will need to think of ways in which they can do something really meaningful for people to even out those feelings of perceived unfairness. Knowing what to do, though, is not easy. And it may just be a case of having to ask people what would be helpful and meaningful for them. Consideration will need to be given to organisations where some of the workforce have been furloughed and others have not. Sectors of the, co the economy where returning to work and opening up of businesses could be into 2021. What can be done to reduce the fairness threats and produce fairness rewards? As I say, the answer is not easy, but it's something that we do and will need to address. As we move towards opening up businesses again, a useful tool to have in your toolkit is what we call the choose your focus model. Again, this was a model from Dr. David Rock. We've spoken a lot about threat responses and human nature is that when we are left to our own devices, the mind will naturally go into its narrative storytelling state and will be drawn towards all the problems of the current situation. And as we all know, if left unchecked, our mind will have a tendency to ruminate, to get bogged down with everything which is wrong. And we get deep and drawn deep into the drama surrounding the situation and start to mobilise our threat responses. What we need to do is watch out for ourselves or our colleagues being drawn into the problem and dwelling upon it. The overreacting state that I spoke about earlier. If we catch ourselves or colleagues starting to dwell, we need to change focus quickly and start moving towards the reward state, which will help to keep the logical cognitive thinking brain open. We can do this by helping people to start thinking about the future, the vision, their vision for what they would like for the future and the solutions that will be required. Encourage people to set achievable targets and goals to start taking small steps towards creating that future, looking for those opportunities and possibilities as they present themselves. Enabling our hard moments, moments of insights, is the key to successfully moving forward and establishing the next norm. No one else can give you an insight, but they can help by enabling the right conditions. An insight is a non-obvious solution that comes from the non-conscious mind. The idea suddenly emerges into your awareness and it combines data in a new way, forming and creating new neural pathways, changing your mind forever, your brain forever. Insights provide solutions. They help people solve complex problems. They provide engagement. They facilitate the activation of the reward system and the release of dopamine. And they create change. They're intrinsically motivating and create changes in the brain with the creation of the new neural pathways. Interestingly enough, only 10% of inc insights occur at work. The majority of people have their insights when they're out walking the dog, in the shower, listening to music, when the brain is in a relaxed state. But, as I said, only 10% of those insights actually occur in work. So, what can we do? What are the 
conditions that we need to have there to support that insight creation? Well, the first one is to provide quiet moments. Move away from or close down things which cause distractions or stimulate activity in your mind. Find a quiet space away from technology, somewhere where you can relax and switch off. Look inwards. This is another way of shutting down, closing out, shut down your visual cortex. Physically close your eyes or look down or look up. Again, helping just to shut out all that external stimulation. Manage exposure to threats. Stay away from news and other situations which you are aware cause you stress. Move towards situations which evoke a positive emotion. Now that could be something like going for a walk, having a cuddle with your, your partner, your children, your dogs, your pets. And stop trying to solve the problem. Now that might sound a bit strange, but if we try too hard to consciously solve a problem, it actually creates a threat response because the harder we try, the harder it becomes due to the stress levels, the threat response, because when we're struggling to do this. So we're creating a threat response for ourselves, impeding the creation of that insight. If we look and think about change, there's actually two ways, two attitudes towards change. The mind can perceive change either as a threat. And if it perceives change as a threat, this causes distress, or as we commonly use the terminology, stress. However, if we perceive the change as a challenge, we don't perceive it as a threat. It's a challenge, something that we can overcome. Then that is actually perceived by the brain as something that is good. You stress, good stress. Some of you will be familiar with the work of Heidi Grant and Carol Dweck around fixed and growth mindset. And Mindset is about a person's ability to perform under difficulty. People who have a growth mindset actually under difficulty get active. They want, they get motivated, they're engaged, they want to find those solutions. Whereas people who have more of a fixed mindset feel overwhelmed, they just give up. Our ability to solve problems. Again, that growth mindset enables people to become more active, to look for the solutions. Whereas with the fixed mindset, it's that overwhelm and giving up. Our ability to learn from feedback is part of our mindset. And people with a growth mindset will actively, proactively ask for feedback. Whereas people with a fixed mindset tend to avoid feedback. Now, don't get me wrong, fixed mindsets are, can be good in the right situation. Fixed mindsets are needed for survival because they're all about proof and demonstrating skills and performing better than others. That's survival of the fittest. But in these disruptive and unprecedented times we're in, a growth mindset is what is required. Growth mindsets see challenges, not threats. They're creative, resilient. They embrace challenge. They're persistent and they seek out feedback so they can constantly be growing and developing. All of this leads to those superior levels of performance and well-being that we need right now to help us establish that new norm. Is it possible to change our mindset? Well, yeah, by what we do, how we do it and when we do it. A few techniques that you might want to consider to help you do that. The first one is what we call instant habits. Instant habits are when predetermined behaviors 
is about sorry having predetermined behaviors when specific conditions arise so for example when situation x occurs i will do y the situation and action become linked in the brain and an automated behavioral response can be developed so if a new team member joins our virtual meeting situation x i will then ask them to share their role how talk to me discuss how they're going to contribute towards the team i will do why labeling a lot of work was done in this area by matt lieberman labeling is about attaching a single word to an emotion and if simply by saying then and expressing labeling our emotions saying that we are frightened frustrated reduces the stress experienced and in reducing the stress again opens up our cognitive logical thinking reappraising a situation kevin oshner looked at the situation in a different says look at the situation in a different way and humor can often be quite a good strategy in actually helping us to change our perspective of the situation but other strategies you could use is things such as saying to a person if this was happening to me what would you tell me to do so putting the boot on the other foot as it were what if you owned the company what would you do direct experience is about being mindful of your wandering ruminating mind the narrative or default mind as it's often termed and it's about being there in the present moment moment by moment in the here and now and if we spend time in the here and now it helps to open up opportunities as they present themselves so we're in the best place to take advantage to see those emerging trends and to be able to react to them early to take action Last year, I think it was the CIPD conference I was at, and I heard somebody say in a presentation, you wouldn't feed a racehorse McDonald's. If we want to get the best from our mind, then we need to put the best in. There are eight key habits that are required for a happy, healthy mind. The first one is sleep. Time asleep is used to refresh and rejuvenate the mind, to relax and repair muscles, to restore our energy. It's just learning superpower. And certainly getting the required level of sleep should be a high priority for everyone at the moment. Because one of the other things that sleep does is actually help to maintain our immune system. If we get too little sleep, it actually has a negative impact on our immune system. And at the moment, we all need good, strong, healthy immune systems. Eat well. We all know about eating food, which is good for our brain health, such as oily fish, avocado, whole grain, nuts, seeds, blueberries. Remember to put those types of foods on your shopping list. Relaxation. How often do you just do nothing intentionally? For 10 minutes or so a day. Again, the brain is vital that the brain has this just downtime. Focused attention. The brain is a naturally wandering organ. It gets bored quite easy, easily. It looks and searches out uniqueness and novelty. So actually being focused is quite difficult for the brain at the best of times. However, by training our brains to focus, helps to promote the development of deep brain connections. So try spending some time each day just focusing on a single task or goal and keep practicing that focused attention. It's important that we don't forget to play hard, to build in some time for those fun things that you enjoy doing, trying new things, doing things that are different. Socialising. There's still plenty of ways that we can socialise. Virtual meetups, 
a game of tennis with a friend, perhaps. Now we can go out, certainly in England, a little bit more. Phone call to the family. Make sure you keep that social connection going. It's vital ingredient, a vital habit for our mental well-being. Exercise. 30 minutes a day, three to five times a week. Is important for our mental well-being as well as our physical well-being. And the last one is reflection. Reflection helps us to integrate our mind by taking some quiet time to focus on what's going on for us, checking in with ourselves. What are our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations, our emotions? Just take that time to check in. Just want to give you a few other little tips that you can do to actually start and leverage the power of your mind. Please, please, please stop multitasking. If you are a multitasker, it's not something to be proud of. It's counterproductive. It creates stress responses, threat responses, rising your stress levels, closing down cognitive thinking, making it harder to do the very tasks and things that we need to be doing. Take a regular break. Every 90 minutes or so, your mind needs a regular break. And it tells you so because you go, you know, I am thirsty. I'm hungry. We perhaps yawn, stretch. These are all the brain's ways of saying, stop. I need a break. Just one or two minutes is all it needs. But how often when you think I'm thirsty, you go, I'll just finish this and then. And two or three hours later, you realise that you never did get that drink. Manage your thoughts. Take responsibility for what you are focusing on. Remember that where you place your attention, where you place your energy is what you will get. So make sure you're focusing on the things that you do want rather than the things that you don't want. And the last one is a really, really important one, especially at this time. With so many of us now working from home, with so many of us now, Zoom calls back to back. And unfortunately, at least when we were in the office and had back to back meetings, very often we got those few minute breaks as we finished one meeting and moved into a separate room for the next meeting. Now we're sitting at our desk. We leave a meeting and we open up the next one without even moving. It really is back to back. The brain is not designed to be constantly switched on. It needs downtime. So make sure you build in some technology-free time each day. I hope that you've got some useful tools and strategies that will help both you and your colleagues achieve more with less stress and be happy, healthy, and be able to perform well. Before I leave you, I'd just like to let you know about a workshop that we're doing. On the 25th of June, it's the first of our Healthy Minds Achieves More workshop. And in these workshops, there's, there's going to be a series of workshops looking at different aspects of achieving a healthy mind and achieving performing more, easier, better, with less stress. Each one of the workshops will be a standalone module, but they will build up into a pathway of learning. We will be sending out further details on this, on the workshops. So please do watch out for that in your inbox over the next few days. If you like what you've heard today, I hope that you will try to join us on the 25th of June because you will love going deeper and delving deeper into what we've touched really the surface of today. I'd like to thank you for listening and hope that you will join us for some of our future webinars and workshops. Thank you.